Good morning and happy Sabbath again to each of you. Let's have an additional word of prayer before we get started with the sermon. Dear loving Father in heaven, as we come to you this beautiful Sabbath morning, we are just so grateful for your loving presence here with us. In our hearts and in our lives, how grateful we are, Father. Thank you that there are holy angels here with us to guard us and to keep us in our ways, to guard our minds and to guide us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to teach us. Father, please send your Holy Spirit now be with us in great measure. We might learn and understand at your feet, Lord, through your word, Lord, change our lives, change our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Last month, um, I started praying about what to share this month, and the subject "Victory Over Appetite" came to my mind. This is a this is a big subject, and not one that's it's not a light subject, but it's a hopeful subject. You know, I've, I've heard people say, "Well, you know, you can't overcome everything, and there are some sins you're just not going to be able to get out of your life." And Jesus understands His blood covers us from our sins, and that's the way it's going to be. But behind the scenes, I've done a lot of one-to-one -one counseling with people who are in distress, spiritual agony, because there are sins in life they can't get rid of. And they don't know how to get relief. They don't know how to get get these sins out of their hearts and out of their lives because they want to do better. They want to change. And they don't know how. And those answers don't work with them. So, you know, it just breaks my heart, honestly, that there are so many people suffering and struggling. And so much of it is unnecessary because they don't know how to get the victory. And a lot of it is because they don't know how to get the victory over their appetite. There are so many people who are suffering emotionally, physically, and spiritually because they don't know how to get God's power in their heart. They don't know how to have a new heart and how to have a new life and how to really be transformed by the Holy Spirit. But I'm so thankful that there is hope in Jesus. You know, this past week, I, um, I was doing a Bible study with one of my neighbors, and we were studying Genesis chapter 1 about the creation. But it's interesting how through those scriptures we got onto all different subjects, and she asked a lot of really good questions. And, you know, it's interesting because God wants all of us to have the hope in Christ that no matter what it is we're struggling with, God has the answer, and God has the help in His Word, and through his, through his Son, through the Holy Spirit, we have a loving Heavenly Father who doesn't want any of His children to suffer unnecessarily, but to bring us hope and happiness, even in this life. We're going to have eternal happiness in heaven, but it starts now. Heaven can be in our hearts right now, no matter what's going on around us. Um. So why do you eat? or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You've many times probably heard this cliche that we are to eat to live, not live to eat. Mm -hmm. But there's hope. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. You know, the scripture tells us great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. What a beautiful promise. You know, in Exodus 20, when God gave the Israelites, and he gave us too, those Ten Commandments, God said, thou shalt not kill. But, you know, I heard an older pastor once say, he never said fast or slow. He said, thou shalt not kill. But there are many people who are suffering today, physically, morally, spiritually, because they don't understand that they are committing slow suicide by their dietary choices. And that they are having struggles spiritually because they can't discern the voice of God because their mind is clouded 
because of wrong dietary choices. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. As you read the scripture, you might think, well, how am I to give myself as a sacrifice to God? Well, that's what I'm going to spend um, step by step some time on how to do that. There are many Bible examples of those who have gone before us who have been faithful to God, those who have learned how to choose wisely, to choose well, to choose God's way through the power of God. You may have heard the story in the Bible about Daniel. I remember when I first, when I was 27 when I became a Christian, and I remember for the first time reading about Daniel in the lion's den, I thought, wow, what is this? I had never heard of that before. But you know, when Daniel was a young man, he had passed other tests, and so he learned to be faithful with God. When Dan Daniel was a young man who was of the noble families in Israel, when he and many other young people, many other young promising men were captured and taken to the country of Babylon, away from their families, away from everything they knew, and they were to be trained as faithful um, uh, young men in the court of the king at that time. They were to be treated well. They were to be fed well, educated well, for, in, for positions of importance. And yet, they were fed food that Daniel, in his upbringing, was taught was not healthy food. And it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which the king drank. Daniel made a choice to do the right thing. God gave him the power and the heart to make the right choice. And then God gave him the power to follow through with that choice. Daniel was blessed because of that. Uh, we won't go through the whole story today, but Daniel's choice... That first choice to eat the right thing led to a succession of other choices that gave him what we now know was that key to success in his life because he became the prime minister of Babylon from being faithful in all the choices that God gave him. You know, he's one of the very few men in the Bible that has no recorded sins. Now we know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but Daniel had no glaring sins that were recorded for our uh, lessons. He had only faithfulness that God wanted to teach us about to show us what a faithful life looks like. You know, Jesus is our ultimate example, but yet he gives us Daniel also to see how he, amidst every odd against him, so to speak, was faithful. What about our first parents? Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He, the serpent, said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees of trees in the garden, but you, God said you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. <clears throat> For God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. There are so many lessons from this one situation. Whenever the tempter comes to us, whether it's in the form of a thought, whether it's in the form of someone speaking the wrong words, 
When someone says to us, did God really say? Did God really mean that? If anyone questions, a clear thus saith the Lord, a clear word of God, your red flag should be up, so to speak. Pray for God to keep you faithful to his word, no matter what. The knowledge of good and evil has been such a sad legacy for all of us. But God wants us, even now in this day, to eat off of the tree of life and to not eat off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whether it's in our food choices, whether it's in our thought choices, whether it's in our actions, what we read, what we watch, what we listen to, whatever we do, eat off of the tree of life. Bring every thought to the captivity of Christ. Every thought that comes in your mind, Lord, ask, is this from you? Is this of you? And if it conflicts with the word of God, reject it. Ask Jesus to take away that wrong thought, that wrong motive, that wrong desire from you. Because God wants us to eat only of the tree of life. God never meant any of us to have to eat of the knowledge, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to focus on eating or the, or the diet and what we intake today um, because it has such a profound effect on everything else in our life. Eating the wrong foods at the wrong time will hurt not only your health, but also your mind, your morals, your spirit, and your soul. Your body must be kept in the best condition to have a healthy functioning brain. And your brain is the only organ of communication between you and your God. So even though some may say, well, it was just an apple, it was a big deal about Eve's sin. It wasn't just about a piece of fruit. It was about faithfulness to God, faithfulness to his word, Obey God no matter what, putting aside your own desires for God's best, there's so much at stake with our decisions. And God has the grace and the power to help us make right decisions continually. This is a time to prepare for heaven. And we can prepare every day with the small tests, the big tests, whatever comes our way. We can be faithful in the little things. This is a quote from the book Councils on Diet and Foods. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. Amen. Wow, when I first read this, it blew me away, honestly. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. This is serious. This is so serious. To think that if you can get the victory over what you eat or whatever you ingest, whether it's in your mind or your stomach, if you get the victory over appetite, you can have the moral power, the grace, that grace that comes from God. You will then be strengthened because you'll have that habit pattern in your brain. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can get the victory over every other sin. Jesus gives us the perfect example. When Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness, he was tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Let me stop here for just a minute. I don't know if we have a word in the English language to make this strong enough and accurate enough. So let me just describe it for you. The, the, the physician, um, Dr. Agatha Thrash, who mentored me when I switched from hospital nursing to health education, the way she explained it to me was this. <clears throat> Someone has been fasting at this point 40 days. The, what happens is initially when someone starts to fast, they're hungry, and then those hunger pains die away, die away, die away, so they're not feeling any hunger. The body works on the principle, if you don't use it, you lose it, so to speak, and it just fades. But 
at the point of 40 days, before the point of death, God has made our body so that there is an all out, all hands on deck, so to speak, cry from every hormone, in, every possible cell in our body screams to eat. Don't die, eat. Don't starve. And so at this point of just before death, just before complete starvation, with the most strongest humanly possible felt pain, suffering of hunger, Satan came to Jesus to tempt him. So if you can understand, if we understand this, it helps us better understand that Jesus passed the most strong test ever on appetite in our behalf. Satan came to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If, what? This is Matthew chapter 4, just before this. In Matthew chapter 3, what happened? And the Lord told him he is the son of God. That's right. When Jesus, Jesus was baptized by immersion, and when he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove, baptizing him with the Holy Spirit, and the clouds opened, and there was a voice that, from God the Father that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. He just heard the voice of God. God the Father affirmed him in his ministry. This angel, so this fallen angel, Satan, knew that Jesus heard that, but he was trying to confuse him. You know, here's Jesus at the point of, just before the point of death, starving, you know, his brain is trying to work, and he's praying for the grace of God. And here comes Satan to tempt him, make these stones become bread. Was Jesus the creator? Yes. yes. How do we know that? Because in Genesis chapter 1, it said, let us make man in our, our image. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then we know through the New Testament, I think it's in Colossians, where it says that all things were made by Him, Jesus Christ. So here is the Creator God, who willingly took on human flesh to become like one of us, to serve us, to teach us, and to substitute for us. He willingly laid aside His divinity that he was not using his divinity. He was struggling and suffering as a man would, as a human being would. And yet, he was tempted by Satan to bail out of this law too long fast and make these stones to bread. But Jesus, who is our example in faithfulness no matter what, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus taught, teaches us a principle here that no matter what, be faithful to God's word. No matter what the test. This takes divine power. This is not in human power accomplished. But God has the power for us to do this. We remember Calvary. We remember who endured temptation in the wilderness, faint, pale, and hungry on the field of battle, that he might work out for man a glorious victory. And when we are tempted to indulge appetite at the expense of reason and health, we remember how Christ overcame Satan, that man might become victor on his own account and in his own behalf. We want to bear these things in mind. Isn't that wonderful to know? If, you know, I remember when I was a new nurse and I was working in a hospital and there was a, my patient who had, was an alcoholic and he was checked into the hospital to detox. I don't even have ever seen someone in what they call DTs or the tremors that an alcoholic gets. It was the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. Well, one of the most horrible things I've ever seen in my life someone have to go through. And I thought, and you know, I wasn't a Christian then. And I thought, oh, this is the most horrible thing to see. Someone who's been, been addicted to alcohol and they're trying to get off of it. Here was, this man was a successful career man, and yet he was, he was just, just suffering horribly to try to get off of this. 
But to be able to tell someone who's struggling with their appetite, whether it's for alcohol or, or something else, there is power and hope in Jesus Christ. He had the victory, and he can give you that same victory. Or if you've known people that are struggling with cigarette smoking, or, or whatever addiction it is, there is power in Jesus. He, he has it. He can give it to you, and he will hold your hand with you the whole way. To me, that is, that is glorious good news. It's not just a gospel of theory, but a gospel of practicality, and a God who really loves and cares about the best and the worst things in our life. The holy intelligences of heaven watch the conflict going on between the tempter and the tempted. This is in the wilderness. If the tempted turn from their temptation, oh, sorry, this is about people, and in the strength of Jesus conquer, angels rejoice for Satan has lost in the conflict. In our behalf, Christ, when weakened and suffering on account of hunger, fought the battle against appetite and conquered Satan. In the name and strength of Jesus, this is even for you young people. The youth may conquer the enemy today on the point of perverted appetite. My dear young friends, I'm saying this to you too. <laughs> Advance step by step until all your habits shall be in harmony with the laws of life and health. He who overcame in the wilderness of temptation declares to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Wow, can you imagine sitting with Jesus? Isn't it be so exciting to see him face to face? And to be able to say to him, thank you Jesus, that you were so real, you were so there for me when I needed you. When you called, Lord, I was able to answer because you gave me the grace. Wow. Jesus overcame on the point of appetite, and so may we. Let us move on then, step by step, advancing in reform, until all our habits shall be in accordance with the laws of life and health. The Redeemer of the world, in the wilderness of temptation, fought the battle upon the appetite in our behalf. As our surety, he overcame, thus making it possible for man to overcome in his name. And again the promise, to him that overcometh will I grant you sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Yet Jesus realistically tells us, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's important we, need to, we each need to study to know God's will regarding a healthy diet. For there are laws of health, just like there's other laws in, in nature. The laws of health can be broken in our diet by alcohol, tobacco, coffee and tea, drugs, overeating. Whether it's bad food or good food, overeating is still too much, even if it's too much of a good thing. Excess sugar, unhealthy fats, unfit animal products, junk foods, snacking, or irritating spices and vinegar. All these things <clears throat> impair our health. They not only impair our health, they impair our brain function. Every single one of these impairs our brain function. And if our brains are working like, right, we can't discern the Holy Spirit. We can't, those, those warnings from Him get numb and fade. We too easily toss it away and fall into temptation, whatever the temptation may be. Each stimulant increases the appetite for the others. So the same list that I've just given you, they each interact. If you're struggling with one, many times you won't get the victory on the other because they all feed into each other. Before I was a Christian, I used to smoke cigarettes. Can you believe I was a nurse smoking cigarettes? I mean, how crazy is that? I would take care of cancer patients, and I'm smoking cigarettes. I mean, talk about the power of denial. I mean, honestly, I've been on both sides of the fence, and I know. And you know, I would tell people, oh, it's easy to quit. And yeah, I quit all the time, but it didn't last. It wasn't until I fell in love with Jesus 
and I was willing to give up anything for him. And I stopped drinking alcoholic beverages. Between those two things, I was able to finally get the victory and stay quit from smoking cigarettes. Praise God. Before I continue, I just want to stop here. My husband has a testimony, and I asked him if he'd share it with you all about how God gave him victory. Because I wanted you to hear a practical application to someone who can share the goodness of the Lord. Now, I'm married to Jean Marie. She's a health reformer. So she teaches me the laws of health. And I can accept it or reject it. And one of the things that um, I struggle with, but you know, we're such experts at justifying ourselves that we justify away what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us for our own good. And me, sugar with the big one. And when we were dating, Jean Marie would call up, said, Where are you? I said, I'm at Walmart. Are you in the cookie aisle? Oh, I was. I was. And I found myself. And, and you know what I do? I said, well, I work it off. I work hard. I do this and this and that. But you know what? He had me. I could deny it. I could anything you want. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you, you know it's wrong. You got to say, God, you got to help me get the victory. And here's, and I struggled with this for years. But about two years ago, Jean Marie, um, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what, it would be on a Friday, you know, you, it's clean up day, right? Well, I go in my truck, my work van, I go in the seat, pull out all the cookie wrappers I had left over. Uh, I was a cookie monster. And I turn around and I make sure uh, she's not over there, you know, this is outside. And there's three trash cans. I go over there, pick one, pick up the trash and stick it underneath there. And there's one time, all of a sudden, Jean Marie, I, I just finished cleaning out. Jean Marie comes, I'm over there still cleaning my truck, and I watch her still in the trash can. She picked the trash can I just was in. But I hid it on the other trash. She goes and lifts up this trash and says, you've been eating cookies again. Oh! I don't want to be weak, I want to be strong. I'm supposed to be the strong guy. So anyways, here's what happened. Here's how the victory came. Jean Marie went on a trip, three-day trip, West Virginia. A little gathering with her friends. She's gone, right? And I knew what I was going to do. No sooner she was gone, I went down to Costco. My second love is cherry pie. And Costco makes a big cherry pie. I didn't figure I could. I went there, they didn't have a cherry, they had an apple. So I said, okay, I'll have an apple pie. I figured I got three days to consume this apple pie. I come from a large family. We don't waste anything. Man, I figured, okay, I might eat this much, this much, this much. Man, that night I ate a quarter of that apple pie, really. I will tell you, I was sick. I could feel too much sugar, uh, way too much sugar. And I was literally sick. I went to sleep that night. Oh, I was sick. And I said, oh, I gotta get rid of the evidence. Next morning, and I gotta finish this pot. She Marie calls up, I'm gonna be gone four days. Good, give me an extra day to get rid of that pot. I'm gonna tell you something, four days, I was sick. Too much sugar. I knew I was sick. And I, I turned around and I literally I cried out. I said, God, give me the victory. Give me 30 days without any sugar. 30 days. I don't know what that difference made, but it did. And, and, and here's another clue. Here's another clue of giving the victory in your appetite. No eating in between meals. Not a crumb. 
not a crumb. Jim Marie, she'll teach you a lot of time how the system works, the washing machine, you put it in there, and I'll tell you something. I struggle with bad breath. And it's the fermentation of the sugar in your stomach. Now I see the kids come to work to eat in between meals all the time, and you can see the odor is there. It's eating sugar from as the food inside of you, and it's going to come out. Don't it? Brush your teeth, floss it. That's not it. It's eating in between meals. And the Lord gave me 30 days. After that, I didn't want to do that. It, it was over a year I had to go to a birthday party. Somebody gave me a piece of carrot cake, another, another favorite. And, and that was so sweet. After you've been off sugar, you would taste how sweet the things were that you used to eat. And you know what the goal is, though? She Marie's not going to tell you this. She tells me more than she tells you. The goal in your diet is to have sweet breath. You know what sweet breath is? You ever kiss a baby? That's sweet breath. And you, you, you know what it is? Kissing somebody who's been smoking cigarettes, right? Like kissing an ashtray. <laughs> you know, and, and Jimmy has sweet breath. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't want you all to eat in between meals, but any of you guys think you're going to kiss on my wife, you'll be eating a knuckle sandwich. <laughs> but and the, but the, truly, the goal is sweet breath. And Ellen White talks about it in writings. And this is something that God wants us to have. This is something God will do. God will give us the victory over those things. Is what? Killing us. Killing us. Literally killing us. And so, yeah, she's an expert at this. You know, I may be physically strong, but this girl here, I, I gotta admit, I've never seen anybody stronger than her when it comes to appetite. You can get the victory there, every other sin, the promise is. We can do it, folks. As a church, as individual, with expert training, the victory can be won. And God will show you how step by step by step. And there's nothing you can't overcome in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who will bring the conviction on you. With that conviction, he brings the way. No praise in Jesus. I'm so proud of him. For what God, God did for him. And I'm just so thankful to the Lord for delivering him. <laughs> you know, God wants us to be holy, happy, and healthy. He doesn't want us to suffer in our health. So many of the diseases that people suffer from are related to the foods they've been eating, and they didn't even know it. <clears throat> the di a diet of whole plant foods, well balanced, and unrefined, that's where health and satisfaction can be found. And that's how the Lord can tell us the meek shall eat and be satisfied. That's the diet he gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and that's the direction that God wants us to all to head with our diets, step by step, to become more and more healthy, more and more plant foods, more and more whole foods, more, more less and less of the refined foods. The more refined foods, the more foods we eat that are not from plants or that have been come from plants and have been altered, not only the less satisfaction, the less nutrition that we have, <clears throat> the more health problems that we have. It's just statistic after statistic. You know, if you've read any of the research out of Loma Linda um, from the Adventist Health Study, there are so many um, heart disease factors, cancer factors. Uh, diabetes, all kinds of chronic as well as acute problems that can happen. But what about our hearts? This is where the bottom line comes. You might see the information, you might know there are things perhaps in your diet or lifestyle that are not the best for your health, but what if you don't want to do it? <laughs> what if you don't want to change? I've had people say to me, I'd rather die than give up my cigarettes. I've had people say, I'd rather, rather starve to death 
but not eat all this meat, even though they're having intestinal problems and heart disease and, and, and all. You know, I'm not here to diagnose and treat any illnesses. This is, I'm giving this to you for educational purposes that this is the sad scenario of many, many people, many of my former patients. But God wants us to get to this point where we can say, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law, even the laws of health, are within my heart. That's victory. Where do we get the help that we need to change, to be like this? How can we be like this when this is not in our human nature? I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. How do we get that help from God? Well, let me show you a little picture. This is a schematic. Brother Steve, this is for you too. But you said one day to me, what about the application? Okay, this is it, brother. <laughs> okay, there you are. You see the little you there. Up on top of the hill is God, but on the other side of that mountain is his will. Whenever you come to the point where you see something that is God's will, it doesn't matter what it is. The principle is the same. The path of victory is the same. Here you are, and over there, whether over there is an action, a thought, a desire, a motivation, something to do, something does not do, whatever his will is, whatever his word, his will is for you at that point in time, you cannot go straight and do his will. It's humanly impossible in the strength. I mean, yeah, you can say, well, I'll grit my teeth and I'll do blank, or I'll grit my teeth and I won't think this wrong thought, or I won't have this wrong desire, this wrong lust, or this wrong stop this action, or I'll quit this addiction. You can grit your teeth and try to do it. But is that victory? Is that delighting to do his will because his law is in your heart? When you grit your teeth and you do it in your own with strength, but then you usually fail is the problem. You usually fall back. But even if you're continuing, you have enough human willpower to keep doing it. Is that really victory? Or is that what they call legalism? You know, but if you see his will, acknowledge his will, understand his will, and instead if you lift up your eyes into the hills from whence cometh your help, your help cometh from the Lord. If you look up to God in your soul, so to speak, in prayer, and you say, Father in heaven, I love you and I want to do your will, but I am powerless over this. And fill the blank, whatever that is. Help me. Put it in my heart. I remember one time the Lord asking me to do something. There was not a cell in my body that wanted to do what he was asking me to do at that very point in time. And I said, Lord, I don't want to do this. But, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, you know I am willing to do whatever you want me to do, even though I don't want to do this particular thing. And I pray, Lord, change my heart. It took about a half an hour of praying. Do you know my heart completely changed? And I, I delighted to do it in the, in the long run. It doesn't matter what it is. It's all the same. God wants us, God wants to, us to love him and depend on him as our best friend, our father, our spiritual husband, our everything, the spiritual spouse for the gentleman. But he wants us to depend on him so much that we can accomplish anything he asks. He's not going to ask us to do anything that we cannot accomplish with his will, with his grace, by his power, with him in our hearts. Isn't that good to know? Amen. And not only can we accomplish it, can we change our thoughts, can we change our feelings, change our actions, but we can rejoice in the Lord always. To me, isn't that like the best news in the whole universe? I think it's incredible and wonderful. It's what I've been wanting. I have wanted all my life. And I'm so excited to share with anybody who's willing to listen and, <laughs> and willing to change. I didn't want to stay the same. By the time I was 27, I was so sick of this world and sin and all the junk and all the suffering. I was ready for something so different. And I'm so excited for God and his good news and his gospel and who he really is. You know, it's not just a name. He's so real. So pray in faith. 
Surrender your will. How do you surrender your will? You say, God, I give it to you. Please take it. Just give it. Just choose. Choose his will. Choose to give him yourself. It's just a decision. It's the great exchange. Lord, I choose. I choose to give you this. I choose to do whatever you ask me. And let him be the power inside of you. So you can say just like Jesus when he was here on this earth. It's not me, Jesus said, that does this works. It's my Father in me. That's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be able to say, <clears throat> it's not me. I'm not a good person. But it's Jesus working in me. He's the one that does these good deeds. He's the one that helps me to love unlovable people. He's the one that helps me to do the right thing when my flesh doesn't want to. And claim the scripture promises where the word of a king is there is power. When you pray those prayers, when you say, Lord, you said you will give me help. I'm, I'm believing it. Lord, you said, look up my eyes to the hills from whence come my help. When you believe that word to be true and you put your soul and your, and your heart into that, he fulfills it. He is so faithful. But remember, there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Isn't that good to know that it doesn't matter the temptation? Every temptation is from who? Satan. That's right. You know, it, it, it said Abraham was tempted of God. God tempts no one, the Bible says. He allowed Satan to tempt. I'm sorry, he allowed Satan to tempt us. He, he, but God tested Abraham. The difference between testing and tempting. But yet, no matter what you're being tempted with, God will make the mistake, mis make the way of escape if you go to him and seek it. But God loves you too much to force you. So he, if you choose to, to surrender to that temptation and to sin, God respects your choice. He loves you too much. He died for your human right to choose. But there is Ecclesiastes 10.17, the blessing. Blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth, and whose princes eat at a proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. If you want to have strong, have strength physically, morally, intellectually, spiritually, a lot of it's related to your diet. Eat at the proper time, meaning eat, eat when it's time to eat. Don't snack. Don't try to eat on a regular schedule as much as humanly possible. You'll have the best health that way and the best mental health and the best spiritual health that way too because it'll help you hear the voice of God better. And not for drunkenness. Your mind will be clear to discern the Holy Spirit. What a blessing. And then someday soon, very, very soon, we can say, Lord, I have hope for thy salvation. And done thy commandments, we can receive that crown of life which Jesus is going to place on our heads. We'll cast them at his feet and say, Lord, it was all you, it wasn't me. But yet, this is the promise and the victory for the overcomer. May that be each of us, is my prayer. Let's close our heads and, and bow our heads, rather. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads, and let's just have a special dedicatory prayer that God will be our victory in everything. Dear loving Father in heaven, we need you as our victory. We need you as a victory over every appetite that's not in harmony with your will. Father, we need you to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Give us your grace. Give us your victory. Help us, Lord, that our every desire would be in harmony with yours, that our will would be in harmony with your will, that our hearts would be filled with your presence through the Holy Spirit. Lord, give us that grace and help us, Father, to win this battle, that we may be victorious for you, that we may have a testimony to share with others, and that someday soon we can be with you in heaven as your victorious children who loved you and believed your word and accepted your power and were faithful, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.